Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special presentation on Sarah Parker Ramon. The music you are listening to is the music of the Chevalier de Saint Georges, who was an African man born in the French Caribbean island of Guadeloupe in 1745. All the events you see on the screen in front of you are coming soon. So there's a number of online events we have coming up. And these are actually some of the seven, actually it's 18 now, 18 events we have coming up in the next couple of months or so. But I'll mention them more later on. For this presentation, we'll be taking questions after the speaker has stopped talking. So we'll take questions using the chat function. The chat function is at the bottom of your screen and there's a little box that says CHAT, um, outlined in red. And if you have a question, you type into the chat box and we'll relay it to our speaker. We'll take questions after the presentation is over. This event is brought to you via the Sarah Parker Remond Center, which is part of UCL, which stands for University College London and Black History Walks. This is just a bit about the Sarah Parker Remond Center. And as you can see, it came out of student-led demands. So this was established in 2019. So not last year, 2010, when you, you knew about the lot, the many student revolt or student demonstrations there were. This is 2019, which links into um, what we had in the UK, which was something called Decolonize the Curriculum, Why is My Curriculum White, and Roads Must Fall campaign. So there's a number of different student-led movements across the country, which were asking for more equality in the curriculum in the teaching staff, et cetera. So the Sarah Parker in one center comes up of student-led demonstrations and requests and demands to actually improve and change the curriculum, make it a bit more or a lot more representatives. So this study, or actually you can read for yourself, um, it's the study of, or the impact of racism, scientific, met metaphysical and cultural. And they do a lot of good work um, physically as also online. And you can see some of the online work here with their podcasts. So they have about, I think it's about 75 podcasts now covering different areas with different um, speakers on a number of different um, uh, parts, of, uh, parts of expertise. And you can access that information on their website right now. Black History Warts runs Warts Talks and Films on African Caribbean history in London all year long, every single month for the last 14 years now. So every month of the year, there's either a, a Get a History Walk or a talk or a film happening somewhere in the capital. So we have about 12 different walks in North, East, South, West London. They last about two hours long. And we take groups of people around and show them all of the African Caribbean history that are in the streets and the architecture buildings because there's lots of it there if you know what to look for. Apart from doing guided history walks, we also have, as I said before, talks in universities. It used to be physical, physical, but now of course they're online. And we have um, a regular film screening program at the BFI South Bank, which is a cinema not far from Waterloo Cube Station. And every month of the year, for about three to four hours, we show films from the African diaspora, and we have a Q&A after films have been shown. It's the only one of its kind in the whole country, and it's called the African Policies Program. We also have a bus tour, a Black History bus tour, and a Black History River Cruise, which I'll show you later on. Our book, Black History What's None and Volume One, comes out this year. And basically, we took two and a half of our 12 walks and put it into book form. And the book we published by Jack and Randa Publishing um, this year in 2021. It was delayed from last year because of the whole virus, but comes out this year. So keep an eye out for that. And I did mention before, we have a number of events coming up. They're listed on the blackhistorywatch.co.uk website. So if you go there, you'll see a whole bunch more events coming up. And you can also uh, add yourself to me so you get advanced notice of all these different events which are coming up shortly. So 
we've been running events in association with the Sarah Parker and Mon Center at UCL for uh, what, three or four months now. And we've recorded most of the lectures that we uh, have organized. So this is a ch the channel you go to to access these lectures. It's just youtube.com slash black history walks. And there you're gonna find all, if not most of the lectures we've done so far. And you can watch them at your leisure. You've got the Superb Success of Saturday Schools. You've got the bookshops one. You have the most recent we did last week was um, British Slave Owners Track the Money and the Stories of Being Slave, which attracted about 2,300 people. So you can actually go to that website, that page, and have a good look at all the information we've done um, delivered via talks. But also, there are about another 150 videos um, about Black history in general, in particular about Black British history on that particular page. So you can go there and check that out. So we're actually raising funds for a plaque in honor of Sarah Parker Raymond. We have a, we actually have two addresses for her. So we're raising funds now to put a plaque in her honor so a lot more people know about her story. And this is um, one of the events we've got to help raise funds for her. It's called the Black History River Cruise. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. I mean, I've been teaching history myself for the last 30, 40 years, but what I saw today, I think um, Black History Walks is taking Black History onto new levels, open up new grounds. Um, the people, the boat itself, the music, the information was absolutely first class and it was proud to be a part of my culture being on this boat. That everyone's got to come on and experience like this. Fantastic. <laughs> It was a beautiful day, very nice. We had the weather, the warmest day of the year. So um, yes, beautiful, really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the boat trip. I thought it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful way for us to learn our history. Um, it's kind of live history, you know what I mean? Because we're, we're sailing past um, um, buildings and stuff that we've probably sailed past or driven past or walked past a hundred times, never knew the significance of that building. just blown away by the boat trip I really am I didn't understand that it was actually picking out all the historical contributions that our people had made along the river and what it all meant I didn't understand that that's what was happening people got what they wanted it was a beautiful day beautiful and sunny so people had that there was the river there was a bit of drink at the bar there was loads of information from SI um, and the characters were amazing, so yeah, it was great. I would recommend it to anybody to come. All right, so that's a bit about our Black History River Cruise, which is raising funds for the Sarah Parker Mon plaque, which you hope to put up fairly shortly. As I said before, we actually have two locations for a plaque in honor, and we just get permissions for one or even maybe even both of them. And this is a fundraiser for her plaque. So she's a really interesting person, Sarah Park Raymond. And to speak about her, we have an expert, Professor Serpus Linius, has written a book. I think it's the only book about her. I might be wrong, but I think it's the only one about her. And um, as you're going to hear today, Sarah Park Raymond is a fascinating person. And Professor Serpus Linius is going to take us through some of her life stories. So now I'm going to hand over to Professor Serpus Linius, who's the next, the next voice you're going to hear is her voice. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much. Let me just get the slides up. And 
There we go. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Warner and Black History Month uh, for having me here. And I also wish to take this opportunity to uh, convey my thanks to Professor Paul Gilroy, whose groundbreaking work uh, influenced the writing of my book uh, on Sarah Riemann. And thank you, Kaisa Karhu. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, for your interest in Sarah Parker Riemann, who is an exceptional woman, super heroine an abolitionist and women's rights ad, ad, activist. And it is my uh, great honor and immense pleasure to talk about her. And I'm thrilled uh, for the University College London's decision to dedicate uh, the research center to Sarah Raymond. She well deserves this recognition. So I will start this presentation by quoting Sarah Raymond. She wrote in her autobiographical essay that was published in London in 1861, about her education in the segregated United States, how she and her siblings were repeatedly refused entry or expelled from schools in Salem because of their race. She wrote, I thought of the great injustice practiced upon me and longed for some power to help me crush those who thus robbed me of my personal rights. Great injustice rubbing her of her personal rights. This, this is a very powerful way to address discrimination. And as she contributed to social and political change, uh, Sarah Riemann was in the core, not in the margins of transatlantic women's emancipation and anti-slavery movements. In her view, hatred of race stemmed from prejudice and intense ignorance. She herself was well-educated to a great extent at home. She was born free in Salem, Massachusetts on 6 June, 1826. And the timing of this presentation is perfect because uh, tomorrow would have been her birthday. And uh, this is her US passport application dated- And thank you, Professor Salinius. Um, the chat box is now open for questions. A couple of questions are already. Uh, can you tell us how did you become interested in, in Sarah Parker Raymond, Professor? Yes, um, so um, I, I had read something, I mean, there is not that much that it has had been public, published about her or, or not much re research that had been done on her in, in 2012 when I was organizing a workshop on, on um, African-American um, slave narratives and um, uh, in particular women's slave narratives. And um, I happened to see a mention of, uh, of Sarah Raymond as I was uh, doing research for the, the, um, uh, the workshop. And um, after the workshop, I took the keynote speaker uh, on, a, on a walking tour in Florence and we, we went past um, the, the hospital uh, where she had studied. And, um, and so um, I just happened to uh, tell her about Sarah Raymond and, and that she studied there. And so she made a comment. She said, and of course, we don't want to know if the documents are there. And so that gave me an idea of um, to look into, um, you know, uh, if the documents really existed in, in, in Florence. And so um, it took quite a while to find the archives because they were not uh, in the hospital. And so I exchanged several uh, emails with the different archivists and colleagues and and finally was able to locate them. And then um, I, I published uh, an essay and thought that, you know, that was my research on, on Raymond and that's, that's the end of it. But then I was curious because um, I had found some material, secondary sources that mentioned that she knew um, James Jackson Jarvis. And, and so I was really curious to, for myself, just uh, to know if she actually knew him. And so I started, looking for information about Jarvis in, um, in uh, Florence. And I happened to find uh, these letters that Edmund Putnam, so the, the nephew and, and his wife had written to some people here in Florence. And so there was this batch of letters and, and I was like, well, I need to do something with these letters. And so that's why I then started um, working on the book, which was quite rapidly written and I didn't really have that much time to focus on it because 
um, I was myself uh, moving, but um, but you know it's once you get start uh, looking into uh, a life that is so rich and so fascinating, it kind of keeps you keeps you going. So that's basically. Okay. Uh, what is the name of your book, and is it available? If so, where can one get your book? Um, the name is An Abolitionist Abroad, Sarah Parker Riemann in Cosmopolitan Europe. And uh, this is the, the cover. And I think you can um, order it um, through internet. Uh, it's published by uh, the University of Massachusetts uh, Press in 2016. So you can probably order it from the United States, possibly also um, from England. So okay. I, I think it's, it's, um, it's available. Did Sarah Parker Mond have any children um, from Sister Marcia? No. Uh, she, she married, she was already 50 years old and, um, and uh, she, as far as I know, at least, uh, she didn't have children uh, before that and it would have been uh, quite um, unheard of to have children if you weren't married and, and the only marriage that I, uh, I know of was to, to this Italian, Lazzaro Pintor. How well known is she in America compared to, to this country, to England? Or UK, I should say. Um, I think she's better known in the the United States, and and um, there is uh, increasingly, um, you know, she's receiving attention and and um, uh, becoming the the um, the subject of um, uh, blog entries and 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 so forth, which is is really great. So. So I think gradually she's, uh, and there were some essays that had been published earlier about her and her family, um, mainly focusing on her stay in uh, her life in, in Salem in, in the United States in general. Is there any memorial to Sarah in Italy? There is one commemorative plaque at the uh, cemetery in, uh, in uh, Rome. So that plaque and, and that that's one of the plaques that um, it indicates her year of birth as 1824. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the two um, different um, years that are have been indicated for her birth are 1824 and 1826. And um, so there are different, um, I guess, different documents, but I have found more evidence to support that she would have been born in 1826 than, than 1824. Do you know the names of any other black suffragettes in the United Kingdom who may have worked with Sarah? I do not. I do not know um, any any others. But it doesn't mean that you know there there could have been because, like people don't know that much about Sarah Raymond. Um, we still have big gaps uh, in in her. There are still big gaps in her our knowledge of her life. So there may be others that we just do not know. That's why I, I think that archival research, even though it, it is very uh, time consuming and uh, very uh, difficult, um, I think it's, it's really important work. Question here from Sean Crichton says, did any of the women members of the Ladies Emancipation Society um, Committee write their memoirs and discuss Sarah Raymond? Uh, Frances Power Cobb wrote her, um, her autobiography, basically, and she mentions Raymond, but uh, doesn't uh, talk about her extensively. So I don't know if that means that, that they didn't consider her um, as, um, um, as something so uh, peculiar that they should have um, talked about Homer. So she is mentioned uh, in a section where she talks about these activist women and men uh, in general. So um, she's one of the, one of the many, uh, the most radical um, activist, of course, um, the, the Taylor couple and, um, and others. Sister Marcia says, do we know anything more about the rest of her sisters? Um, not that much. Um, um, so many of them married into families that um, also were very active, um, fighting against uh, uh, slavery, 
uh, discrimination, uh, segregated uh, schools. So, um, so it was a very intense family and extensive uh, family. Um, so Susan was a, a fancy cake maker uh, and her, um, her premises were also uh, a, a place for activists to, to meet. And then Caroline Riemann, she's the one who traveled the most and she lived in, in England and Rome. Um, and and her, her son was of course in, in Italy as well and in, in England. So, um, but I haven't been able to find much information about the, the other sisters. Okay, Leslie asks, why did she choose Italy over the UK? Was it because of its superior cultural opportunities or her friendship with Mazzini? Did she keep in contact or even campaign in conjunction with US activists to campaign for equality whilst abroad? So she did uh, follow what was happening in the United States. Um, I quoted that one letter that she uh, sent to uh, London, a London newspaper. Um, so she did follow the events. Uh, she was in touch with the um, with Americans. Um, there aren't that many uh, letters that have survived. So it's very difficult to, to have any certainty on, on how much she was still involved uh, in the situation in the United States. And uh, why she chose Italy? Um, well, perhaps because of the medical school, uh, if she had gotten into medicine uh, when she studied to become a nurse, then it would be logical that, um, that she would then choose the Europe's most uh, prestigious medical school for her studies. Another reason may be if she already knew Edmonia Lewis, for example, uh, Lewis uh, arrived in, uh, in uh, Florence um, uh, in, uh, a year before uh, Sarah Raymond, and then um, Lewis moved to, to Rome uh, in that spring of 1866. And so, and then uh, uh, Sarah Raymond came here in August, 1866. So um, she might have, if they knew each other, which I haven't been able to confirm yet, but they, have, they may have met in, uh, in the United States, either in Ohio or through, uh, they have friends in common, uh, Garrison was one of them. And so, um, so that might be one reason. Another reason was that, that Italy really attracted um, Americans at, at that time. So uh, a lot of the intellectual elite came to, to Italy, uh, artists, writers, um, you know, anybody who was looking for uh, sophistication, culture, history, they wanted to learn about manners and, and um, this dolce far niente, Italian uh, way of life uh, attracted uh, the art galleries. Um, the United States didn't have anything similar. And, um, but the question why she then didn't go back to England, um, that is something that I, I really uh, do not know. And I'm, I'm trying to find out because um, I'd be really curious because to me it seems that that it was a conscious choice that she cho chose to remain Italy rather than uh, return to England, which probably was her initial intention. Nika says, why were, <clears throat> excuse me, why were American newspapers writing about her when she moved to Europe? Do we know? What was the tone? Um, well, uh, it was, um, well, American newspapers followed uh, Europeans, uh, followed Americans who were in, in Italy uh, in general. So uh, they were writing about Sarah Riemann, they were writing about Edmundia Lewis. And of course, for Americans, um, what was striking was that, that um, there were these two black women uh, who were successful. And so um, it's probably, every single time that they talk about either Raymond or Louis, they mention their, their race. Question here from David, he says, could Sarah have known Princess Sophia? So we, over here we have a princess called um, Sophia Dulip Singh. Um, she was a suffragette as well. And the question is, do you think Sarah Parker Raymond may have known Princess Sophia Dulip Singh? Hmm. I haven't looked into that. So that's something that I would uh, need to do more research on. I haven't, um, 
I haven't uh, found any mention of of um, of her in um, any of the documents that I have looked at. So I'm not sure how much she was involved in the same circles as as Sarah Riemann. But it's it's possible because also I have not been able to read um, any of the. Uh, Clementia Taylor's letters, for example. And so um, I think that would be a source to find more information about um, other people who were in the in the same circles. So but that's that's a very good good point and something that I need to look into. So thank you so much for that. Do you know if there's a, a Sarah Park Raymond Society in America that kind of recognizes her legacy? No, not yet, at least, and as far as I know, and and I think it would be a really good idea to um, to form a, a society. Okay, Sean Crichton's got a quote. He says, "The Freeman's Friend newspaper records receipts from England for June 1865, ending with a line: profits of a concert as returned till date 16177 per Miss Sarah P. Raymond." Can you throw light on this? Uh, could you repeat the beginning part? Sorry. Yeah, the Freeman's Friend newspaper records receipts from England for June 1865, ending with a line, profits of a concert as returned till date 1677 per Miss Sarah P. Remont. Can you throw light on this? Hmm. I wasn't familiar with that at all. So that's something that I, uh, I'd be very interested in, in, in looking into. Um, Sarah Raymond and her family members um, uh, contributed uh, funds. Uh, as I said, they, they, um, she also participated in these fundraising efforts for the unification, unification of, um, of Italy. They contributed to, um, yes, journals, um, uh, fund, fundraising efforts um, uh, for, for um, abolitionism. And, and so they, they were very active uh, in, in uh, many, many different ways and, and also financially supporting uh, these. Uh, we have Caroline Putnam's name also that appears in, in many documents. So, but this is something I really would uh, be interested in, in looking into. So thank you for bringing that up. Audrey says, can you tell us anything about her time in the north of England, Leeds, York, etc. in the 1850s? We've been interested in Sarah Parker Ramon for many years. That's from Audrey. Uh, okay. Um, uh, well, I have been following the, the trail of uh, that is has been um, uh, that it can be found in uh, in uh, newspapers. So newspapers reported um, on on basically her talks and um, reported on um, people who were present there. And um, um, I don't recall at this moment uh, any specifics that I could uh, mention. But she had very intense lecture tours. Um, uh, all over England and Ireland and Scotland, and sometimes she was really tired, and um, and so she, because she spoke uh, to these packed audiences, she also spoke in uh, women's uh, associations. Um, so um, so she she had um, you know very intense uh, schedules for lecturing, and um, at this moment I can't recall, but um, I, I talk about them in. Um, in the book, and I can, I'd be happy to look up more information if you, if you uh, wish to leave uh, the contact information. So, okay. Dexter says, did Sarah write or contribute to any publications in any medical journals? Uh, I haven't been able to find anything, and I don't think that uh, many. Uh, many of these women contributed to these medical publications. It's, I think it was um, a lot of them were um, men and they were higher in higher positions. And um, so um, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it would even be likely that she would have been writing to, to medical journals. Of course, there weren't that many uh, to start with at the time. So, um, yeah. Marie says, um, thank you for a wonderful talk. Were Sarah's public speeches published at all? 
Yes, her public speeches, at least uh, parts of them. So parts of them have been published in uh, newspapers of that time period. So uh, they usually reported very um, uh, in, in, in great detail uh, what she talked about and, and how she talked and, and all that. And then there are a few publications uh, that have collected uh, some of the talks. Um, so, you know, different publications uh, have different talks um, that have been gathered together and, and uh, published. What are you working on at the moment? Okay, at the moment, I'm still working on Sarah Raymond. Um, she doesn't let go, uh, or I won't let go. And, uh, but I'm looking at um, actually uh, like a, a larger group of uh, African Americans in, in Italy and also in France. Um, so Sarah Raymond, uh, her sister Caroline, Edmund Putnam, and his wife, and then Edmonia Lewis, the sculptress. And then there was a third woman who lived in, in Rome around the same time. And um, her name was Sally Mercer. And she was uh, the assistant of the famous American actress, Charlotte Cushman. So my research is really focusing on, on Sarah Rehm and Edmonia Lewis and Sally Mercer. And I'm trying to find out if they knew each other because uh, none of the sources that I have consulted so far place them all uh, in the same place at the same time. But they knew so many of the same people and they were in, uh, in Italy at the same time that it would be very strange that they uh, wouldn't uh, have known each other. So, but then of course, I don't know um, if they socialized with each other. So even if they, uh, if they knew of, of each other, they may have not been socializing each other. They had uh, different backgrounds and um, very different professional uh, careers, uh, career choices. So, um, um, so I'm, I'm looking into this. I, I find it really fascinating to, uh, to try and um, learn more about their exceptional lives because they were all uh, exceptional women. Um, question from Petra. Thanks for an amazing talk. I wonder what was the source of wealth that allowed Sarah to live the cultured life she did live? Was it solely her income or other resources too? So um, she came from a very uh, prosper, relatively prosperous family, first of all. Her uh, sister, especially Caroline, was um, quite um, uh, wealthy, I would say. Uh, she had invented this uh, hair lotion uh, that, that she sold and then um, for, for against uh, people who are like for, for people who are losing hair and uh, becoming bold. And, and then um, he, she also ran this uh, hair salon and made wigs uh, together with the, some of the other sisters. And so when Caroline would travel, she would travel first class. And that was really exceptional in the 19th century for anybody. And so, um, so she would travel first class. So it, it's possible that, that um, some of that funding um, uh, that allowed uh, Sarah to, to live in Italy came from her. But then, uh, of course, there were they uh, when she was lecturing, when Sarah Raymond was lecturing in England, they collected funds to to um, cover her expenses and so forth. And and so uh, in Italy, I I think that then she actually did have a, a career here. Although I have not been able to find uh, documents that other than the newspapers uh, that mentioned that she had a very uh, successful career that would support that because. They um, in Italy, it was not common at the time to um, to register anywhere um, uh, these um, obstetricians. So you could choose either to be a private obstetrician, which I think Sarah Raymond uh, might have been uh, working with the foreigners and and um, and in the upper social classes, or then you could be a, a public obstetrician, and so. Um, I, I don't think that she, well, I, I mean, I don't know, but uh, none of those were recorded anywhere, or registered anywhere. So I don't know exactly what she did, but, but I think that she did have, uh, she did have a career. So uh, she got funding uh, from that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, um, the, the death uh, 
the document of her death because it's not a, really a death certificate. It was written after afterwards uh, mentions that she became a surgeon. So medico chirurgo, uh, she was at the time of her death. So I'm still trying to find out if if um, if she actually did become a, a, a surgeon. Um, there were surgeons, women who became surgeons uh, that graduated from the the medical school where she studied uh, already hundreds of years, maybe a hundred years before uh, she did, but um, but I haven't been able to find. Um, she's not registered in. Uh, the medical school as a as becoming a surgeon uh, in the one in Florence, and I've uh, been trying to um, check the documents in other medical schools uh, in Italy to find out if she actually did become a surgeon. But so, so far, I haven't been able to find any any proof other than this document of her death. So, just to be clear, then um, she was a doctor, but she was not a surgeon. Yes. Okay. Um, Sister Marcy says, do you think there were more black women in, sorry, go back. Do you think more black women lived in Italy than men in the 1850s, 60s? Um, that's a really difficult question because um, there aren't, um, uh, not much research has been done on these uh, uh, black uh, residents. Uh, in in Italy, so um, there there are some studies on on Edmonia Lewis, um, and then of course uh, Sarah Raymond now is is um, getting more attention. Um, of men I know who lived here, I know uh, only of um, Sarah Raymond's uh, nephew Edmund Putnam. So uh, this doesn't mean that um, there weren't others. It's just that. Um, I'm not aware of them and, and, and I think they have not been studied. And so um, again, I, <laughs> I uh, bring attention to the importance of uh, studying archival records. Professor, Professor Salinas, are you in Italy now then? Yes, I'm in Florence, yes. Oh, okay, because yes. we fought you in Finland for some reason. Uh, yeah, oh, well, uh, that's because I teach in, in Finland, but um, I live in, in, in Florence, so, so my home is here. And, um, and so uh, this year I, I actually um, didn't go to Finland um, at all because I, I received a research grant uh, from uh, Vera Foundation and Smithsonian American Art Museum. So because of COVID, then I've been working remotely from, from Florence. Uh, and just of interest, um, are you allowed to travel from Italy to this country, to England? Uh, yes, I, I think it's possible. Again, um, I don't. I haven't checked the the latest uh, um, update on that, but but I think uh, I I'm I have my vaccine. So uh, I'm asking only because um, hopefully when we um, unveil the plaque, we can invite you over as a special guest or something. Um, but once we have confirmation, it's all going to go. Ahead. We'll definitely let you know when and where, etc. But um, Hopefully that should happen this year. We're, we're fingers crossed. You just got to get some permission from the um, a couple of buildings, and then we'll be good to go. Thank you. That would be an enormous pleasure and honor to be there. And and I'm I'm so so happy that you're you're working on this uh, this commemorative plaque uh, for Sarah Raymond. Yeah, we have a whole bunch more lectures with her name on it to, to go between now and the end of the year. So there'll be a lot more awareness raising taking place. So we've come to the end of our session. So thank you to the audience for turning up. Thank you to Professor Serpselinas for her amazing research. And again, look, just mention your book again, please, and where we can get it from. Yes, so it's An Abolitionist Abroad, Sarah Parker Raymond in Cosmopolitan Europe. And um, I, I think you can get it uh, online, um, hopefully also in, um, uh, in the initiative of, of uh, smaller bookshops that uh, find uh, information, find um, uh, distribute books uh, that you can order. So hopefully they also have it. Okay, cool. All right, so Professor, you can have a look at the chat box in the meantime and see a few compliments for you coming in. Um, we'll leave this open for about five minutes and we'll switch it off. So we've got five minutes before we switch it off, but have a look at the chat for your information, uh, Professor. Okay. Thank you. And thank you so much for all of these wonderful questions. Uh, and, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about Sarah Raymond. Thanks.
see. Okay. So thank you very much.